Hi, welcome to Get Lit. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine. And I host this um, interview show where we meet local authors here at the Walnut Creek Public Library to talk about their writing, their books, and their use and love of libraries. Now today we're going to twist things up a little bit because I get to be the guest on the show and not the interviewer. Uh, my first book, The Setup, a uh, true story of dirty cops, soccer moms, and reality TV came out uh, earlier this year. And so um, Lisa Wren, longtime features editor for the Contra Costa Times, who's familiar with the book and this story, um, is going to be asking the questions. So I'm looking forward to this. Thanks, Lisa. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again, Pete. Um, and uh, again, as I told you before, I really enjoyed this book. It was it was a real page turner. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, one could say it wrote itself, but obviously it didn't. It was a whole lot of work, but it was a heck of a good story. So I'm going to go ahead and let you talk, you know, set up how you became this accidental investigative reporter as you describe yourself in the book in the setup. Well, I'm a longtime lifestyle reporter for Diablo magazine. And Diablo um, has been in publication in the East Bay here for 35, 36 years. It's not a um, deep investigative publication. We do celebrational stories about the East Bay. Uh, lots of pop culture stuff. I'm a big entertainment geek, and so I love writing stories about filmmakers and authors and musicians who have a connection to the area. And I was pitched um, a, a story by a publicist about this uh, private investigation company based in Concord, uh, Butler and Associates, owned by a, a former Antioch police officer named Chris Butler. And uh, Chris Butler had a, 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 a pitch that he hired suburban soccer moms from the East Bay, trained them to be these crack investigators firearms training, martial arts, self-defense, and investigative techniques. Why soccer moms? Um, he had this whole hook that, um, that, that moms had a sixth sense um, about right and wrong, that moms were team players, and that he had always been hiring uh, usually retired male police officers to be PIs, that they were very competitive, they didn't work well as a team, and that moms had all these skills that came from being moms that directly applied to being private investigators. Okay. And I wasn't the first one that, that received this pitch, by the way. Right. By the time I started reporting about the PI moms and Chris Butler, they had already been featured in People Magazine, uh, The Today Show, and Dr. Phil. They'd gotten a lot of national press. All of these programs and publications loved the idea that these sort of uh, average soccer moms from suburbia were being turned into these, you know, deep cover investigators with this really sexy job. It was a, you know, it was a really fun pitch. And the reason that I was going to do a story for Diablo magazine is not only was this, you know, working as sort of a business pitch, but after they received all this national attention from these magazines and, and, and TV shows, Lifetime Television uh, ordered a reality show to be filmed about the PI moms of the San Francisco Bay Area. So they were about to be a national, you know, sort of water cooler moment. Uh, these, these six suburban moms from right here where Diablo covers, um, you know, lifestyle. These people that would get the magazine in their mailbox right. um, were so about they, to be on national TV. And so they invited you along for a set up. Yeah, I, uh, they, they said, you know, you can not only interview us about our business right. and about how we were trained to be PI moms, but you can watch us in action. Right. We'll take you out in the field on a case. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. And, and I'm a huge sucker for detective right. books and movies. And, and so the, the book is packed with, with references to Columbo and the Rockford Files and, and Raymond Chandler right. type stories. But I was also, um, as a journalist, kind of interested in how these moms who weren't, you know, um, celebrities, they were just people from our neighborhood, how their lives were going to change once they were on a national reality show. I'm actually not a fan of reality shows. I think they're kind of gross. And, and I don't and are you? <laughs> I don't watch them. Has your opinion changed at all since this, or is it? This is such a weird story that it's like, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm willing to give most of reality television um, a pass on on that because the people in this story are so just diabolical and despicable right. that 
I, I imagine probably a lot of people <laughs> in reality TV are, are, are just as gross. But um, <laughs> what happened was they took me out on this case. It was a, an, an infidelity investigation. This, I, I met the client and she was very emotional and she believed that her fiance uh, may be having an affair and she had hired the PI moms to, uh, to, to tail him. And um, I was going to ride along in this minivan with these two PI moms. Um, and I, I felt really badly for her. Um, the agreement was I wouldn't identify her in the story. And, um, but she was willing to let Diablo write about her experience. And, you know, I was more interested in writing about how these suburban PI moms' lives were going to change after they became reality okay. show celebrities and less about the sort of sad you know, results of this investigation, right. which uh, by all appearances gave the impression that this guy was was cheating on his fiance. Well, yeah, and, and we're going along on the ride. That's where you get really good color for the story and you get a sense of it and, and you, you can create the narrative. Right. So, and they gave me quite a narrative. I um, I sat in the van with these two PI moms and we we followed a guy from Lafayette to the gym in Moraga and he went into the gym and I thought, boy, we're going to sit in here for three hours while he works out. Well, he came out in five minutes, all dressed up to go out wine tasting for the day. We followed him out to Blackhawk where he picked up a young woman and then up to Napa and we sort of tailed this guy around all day in Napa for up to 10 hours. It was, it was, it was all day on a Saturday. <laughs> it was my day off actually, but I was in the van with these PI moms. And it just became more and more bizarre and lurid. Like at one point we sat at the same um, outdoor cafe table with the couple that we were following. And the PI, I said, I don't think we should be this close. And the PI mom said, they have no idea. You know, they're in their own world. So were you little know. red flags starting to come up at that point? There were red flags about the, this bizarre professional procedure of the, right. of the PI moms. But the idea that this was all a hoax, that I was being played for a dummy to, to place a story in a, in a local magazine, that didn't come up until much later. And that's what it turned out to be. Okay. This case that I was observing was a complete hoax. They hired actors for, um, for the PI moms to chase. Chris Butler, the head, of, head investigator, um, hired a... Uh, a friend of his to pretend to be a cheating husband. The woman who I saw crying and, and have a, a, a little meltdown about, you know, that she needed these PI moms to tell her what was really going on, she actually had been a client. Uh, she had actually read about the um, PI moms in the Contra Costa Times, and that's how she that's how she came to to meet Chris Butler, and and she really had hired Chris Butler to catch her fiance. In a, in a sticky situation, and and he did. Then she recreated that for my case in a total, right. you know, fraudulent case. Okay. So um, so it was it was just mind blowing to realize that that this elaborate hoax had been um, orchestrated only for me. And you discovered that when? When you opened your email one like, couple of days later? No, it was like three months after I went on this write-along. Okay. I still needed to write about the reality show. And in fact, I was always kind of flummoxed at how elaborate that write-along had been because that wasn't really going to be the main part of my article. The, right. the article was going to be about this television show, right. which hadn't started filming at the time I went on the ride along. So the show starts filming about six weeks after I, I go on this ride along case. Okay. And while, and it filmed for several months. And while they were filming, I would call and say, look, I need to come visit on the set right, because I right. need to see how you're filming all this crazy <laughs> stuff that we, like how on earth would you, you know, follow around this cheating husband with a camera crew and a boom mic, you know, like right. it just, that was beyond me. Right. And um, the show that was filming for Lifetime was just immediately um, encumbered by production issues. And all of the egos that you see on The Real Housewives or all these shows were amplified tenfold in this little cast right. of characters filming the P.I. Moms show. And there was one particular character who was feeling shut out. One of the, one of the participants in my ride-along 
did not get to be a part of the PA Moms right. television show. And he was indeed a real actor. In fact, was an actor and, and thought, look, you know, I've been setting up this journalist from Diablo magazine and I've been taking part in these, um, these really insidious scams that PI Chris Butler was running when they were actually running real cases. They were things like setting people up to be arrested for DUIs right. in Danville. Um, and now he didn't get to be on this TV show. That was not acceptable. So uh, he sent an email to the editorial team at Diablo Magazine and said that that ride along was a hoax. Under an alias. Un using an alias and said that ride along was a hoax. Don't publish that article. Was, his intention was to sort of sabotage the publicity that his boss was going to get. Thinking that by sending a fake, by using a fake name, sending an email, tipping us off about that ride along being a hoax, that that would kill the story and the article on Diablo would never be published. As soon as that, that email came in, the light bulb went off that this was a hoax. I had been played for a fool. Now, I discussed it with the editorial team at Diablo Magazine, and they, they, they had me recount like how elaborate the ride-along was. Right. They said, there's no way. There were nine adults who conspired to lie to Diablo Magazine. The, the email has to be a hoax. Right. Like, there's no way that that many suburban neighbors of ours here in the East Bay would go along with such a nasty lie just for a publicity stunt. Right. But I had been the one in the van all day, and it just answered all these questions. Did all the I things had. that the uh, things that didn't course, seem if, quite right then began to go? Oh yeah, right. that makes sense. If yeah. everybody was in on it, right? That's why we could follow this car along <laughs> one car length behind all day, and the, the guy would never say like, yeah. "Can I help you?" So, um, so, but not for a second did I say, "Well, we should kill the story," because these were people that were about to be on a national television show. They they were on a reality show. And they were liars. They were yeah. con artists. But this, the, the trajectory of your story was beginning to change at this point. Exactly. <laughs> this was going to be a very fluffy piece about, you know, how people's lives change when they're on reality TV. But basically, these are nice people who, you know, we're going to talk about them at the water cooler on right. Tuesday after their, after their show's on the air. And that maybe one of them's going to be on Dancing with the Stars if right. the show's a hit. You know, that was the trajectory. All of a sudden, it was like, well, look, if they lied to me, if they went all, if they all conspired to create this whole scam to get, you know, which I found really mean-spirited. Like, yeah. Diablo's a, a nice magazine that tries to celebrate people in the community and volunteers who are heroes of the community, you know, and here these people are just blatantly lying to us. It also asked, made me ask the question, were they lying to Dr. Phil? Were they lying to People Magazine? Were they lying to the Today Show? And in fact, yes, yes, and yes, right. they were. All the appearances that you right. saw with these PI moms, or almost all of them. And that were, all comes out as later in the story as, you, as this begins to unravel. So or come one, together. one big theme of this, of this book is look how far people are willing to go for this shot of 15 minutes of fame. Right. Most of us aren't interested in being on a reality TV show, or uh, I hope most of us <laughs> aren't, you know, but obviously a lot of people are. Yeah. And, you know, 20 years ago, you had to be a really skilled actor to, you know, be on a hit show and you had to get that lucky break. Right. You know, but now it, it, you might just have to be the loudest housewife. You know? Right. And, and that's kind of what this group of, of people were interested in doing, and they didn't even want they weren't even real. They were just liars who were willing to lie to the national media, lie to the local media, lie to Diablo yeah. magazine, and expect us to write these favorable stories. Right. So not for a second did I say, well, I'm just going to kill the story then. I wanted to write about these people who are about to be on Lifetime right. television. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, there, there, with, um, there was, of course, the setup and the PA moms, but there was also another dark side going on um, with, with drug sales um, and uh, even at one point some C4 explosives that Chris, Chris Butler in particular, who is in jail, will be there for a while longer. He was, um, he, in addition to the things that he, he was doing with the PI moms, he was trading drugs on the side and because he was this PI and former cop, he had, he had people in this web, and he also used it as an extortion to a certain extent as well. But you came into this information as well, and this is when things got a little bit, you started losing sleep over this story. Right. 
So I was pretty stressed out that I had been <laughs> lied to and, you know, that how am I going to publish this article? Like, I'm right. going to prove that this was a lie. Right. So I'm working on that. And this email informant, Ronald Rutherford, right. is just dumping as much information as everything I ask him he comes back with a response and, and gives me more, gives me a, a map that had been emailed out to all the players in this ride along that showed all the locations we were supposed to go. So there was nothing spontaneous that I was witnessing. It was all mapped out and everybody that participated in that ride along had the addresses of the cafe and the winery and the, uh, the outlet mall that we were going to follow these, these couple on their, on their date. And, and it was, I was curious, why is this person so enthusiastic about providing this information? And I found out very quickly who the, my main suspect for who this, right. this source of information was. And, and, and my suspicion was that they were very jealous that they didn't get to be on the reality TV right. show. So they were spiteful. They had, you know, they had gone through with all these setups. They would lied to the media, and now they didn't get to be They're on TV. They're not going to get so, their 15 minutes of fame. Which I thought was a pretty interesting um, character trait. Right. However, about a week after uh, you know, I get this in initial email, the St. Ronald Rutherford writes again and says, look, there's something much more sinister going on here. Chris Butler is involved with very serious criminal activity, and local police are involved. So more emails go back and forth, and Ronald Rutherford is asking me if I can put him in touch with a trusted law enforcement source. But who do you trust? He's asking the entertainment reporter from Diablo Magazine, <laughs> of all people. Because Chris Butler, Rutherford alleges, is selling narcotics that are stolen out of the evidence locker of the Contra Costa County Narcotics Task Force. Right which is run by a former Antioch police officer and a then current state of California Department of Justice agent named Norman Welsh, longtime associate of Butler's from when, back when they were cops together in Antioch. So I Google Norman Welsh and it turns out that Diablo had mentioned him in an article about prescription painkiller addiction years before. And Welsh is always out in front of a camera saying, you know, we busted this meth lab in you know, this part of the East Bay and we busted this cocaine dealer here and right. he was the top narcotics right. agent so, so you the, can't go to him no you can't go to the top narcotics agent about somebody selling stolen drugs and if you can't go to that guy you can't go to his right hand man right. either so who do you go to right. it so happened that not from my career in journalism but my career working as a teacher in an after school center in walnut creek i knew a retired uh, she's retired now. She wasn't. She was still active at the time. Uh, an investigator for the Alameda, Alameda County DA's office named Cindy Hall, right. an actual soccer mom right. whose kids play right. soccer, and one of the heroines and an of actual the book. investigator. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, actual subject for that TV right, show right. where everybody else was a liar. But of course, Cindy <laughs> Hall has no interest in being right. in reality TV. So I call Cindy Hall. I hadn't talked to her in years and years, and I I say, can I? take you out for coffee. I got to talk to you about something. She can tell this is weird. Like the guy that used to kick soccer balls around with my son is yeah. like super stressed about something that he's working <laughs> on for his magazine. So I explain that I have this information that the head of the narcotics task force is selling drugs. And in addition to that, the allegation that Chris Butler, the PI is looking to sell two pounds of C4 plastic explosives. I got that information just a few days after um, the, uh, the congresswoman from um, Arizona was, was Gabby Giffords, Gabby Giffords was, was uh, shot in this horrific incident where one of these people who's like angry and mentally ill uses a handgun and, and causes, you know, carnage. A horrible carnage. And these things keep happening as I'm reporting the story. There's another one in Sandy Hook. There's another one in, in Colorado. And the idea that somebody like that, the damage that they could do with right. two pounds of military-grade explosives, I realize I have to do something. I may be being played again by one of these liars because I don't have evidence that Norm Welsh is selling drugs. Right. I just have allegations. I have a photo of two pounds of shrink-wrapped marijuana. But I just felt like I needed to say something. So Diablo didn't know how how deep this had gotten, but I set up this meeting with Cindy Hall 
and Cindy Hall was able to get the ball rolling and put Ronald Rutherford in touch with uh, what ended up being Norm Welsh's supervisors at the Department of Justice. So um, that's how the investigation began. And so fast forward, eventually there were a lot of arrests, including Norman Welsh and, and, and Chris Butler. And one of my favorite parts of the book is the scene that takes place in the Rossmore parking lot where, where the informant is wearing a wire and, uh, and it, it, you know, Right there, one of the most famous retirement you know, communities in all of, of California is happening in their local Safeway. There's right. this huge, uh, uh, basically, bust going on and are being, being, uh, being set up. So, so at one point, it's made the, when everything comes together, and we can go back and talk some more some details, but I want to talk about the part. Suddenly, this is a national news story, and you, the Diablo Entertainment reporter, had, had broken it. And... Uh, Television comes calling, and at one point, This American Life comes calling. And uh, what was the time frame between the time you first went out on the ride and you got the call from This American Life? So I went on the ride along on September 11th, it's a memorable date, September 11th, 2010, which was a Saturday. Right. The email from Rutherford came in the first Monday morning in January. Okay. And within six weeks of that email, Chris Butler and Norman Welsh had been arrested. So in mid-February 2011, okay. Butler and Welsh are both arrested and charged with 28 felony counts, including okay. stealing a pound of meth out of the evidence locker and selling it, stealing marijuana, steroids, um, and numerous right. other um, uh, charges. Um, after those arrests were made, I then told Diablo Magazine that, um, hey, we're sitting on a huge story here because right. I'm the one that that turned these guys into law enforcement. And the article, the original article came out in the April issue of Diablo, which was um, in late March of right. 2011. Within a month, um, a guy named Josh Behrman, who's a contributor right. to This American Life, um, read the article and contacted me and said, look, I think this would be, you know, in really in it, it would be really interesting to hear you tell this story because I wrote the article in the first person voice and This American Life uses that, you know, that okay. first, uses real, characters telling their stories. And I'm a huge fan of that show. I just right. think it's an outstanding um, radio documentary. And so I was thrilled to, to be invited to participate in that. Um, so uh, it, was, it was April of 2011, and the episode aired in September. Okay. So about six months after the article came out. Okay, so what was that like to tell, talk about the circumstances under which you got to hear your story being told on national, one of the, probably the most re respected national uh, radio programs around? Well, I'd love to say it was the thrill of a lifetime because I was so excited to get to be a part of it. But as you see in the book, m more information about the characters is unraveling as this American life is reporting right. my story. Um, and, and, and Rutherford, who uh, I'm comfortable with just calling him Rutherford for the purposes of this okay. interview because it just is such a complicated story. Right, it's a very complicated story, but very well told. But thank you, but he, <laughs> he really wanted attention. So right. in the days and weeks after I put him in touch with the right people, he was emailing me very specific details about drug deals and all these things that I should not, as a journalist of all people, he should not have been telling, but I kept a lid on it. And um, he thanked me for saving his life and thanked me for doing, you know, for putting him in touch with the right people. When my article came out and I started being asked to be interviewed for This American Life and local TV interviews and everything, really saw 180 from this right. guy. He did not like that I was getting attention. Right. And this was the sort of the same thing that the PI moms had been through, that they were right. getting attention and why not him? Right. So I started getting these, you know, sort of threatening emails from him like, you know, I'm gonna expose you to the Chronicle and they're gonna say that you're a liar. And I'm like, well, I'm not a liar. The article's accurate, and but you deserve credit for what you did. You know, he at that point was a protected right. informant, right. but lost that protection but, um, because the, the the DA's office said, "Look, he's right. giving interviews, giving quotes right. to the Times, he's giving quotes to the Chronicle. Right. He's not a protected informant right. if he's going to put his name out there." So this just this just ex made the story a bigger story and much more tension around it. So it was it, probably very cool to hear it, but it, there was a lot of drama going around. There was a lot of drama it. about this attention, about right. the you know the spotlight change from lifetime television to This American right. Life okay. and later to 48 Hours. And so, you know, I was trying to be as fair as I could to everybody. I said, yeah. no longer an informant. If you want to talk to This American Life, I'll put you in touch. Mm -hmm. 
So this person went on the record with This American Life, but as this was happening, I was really r pulling back the, the curtain on this character as well and realized right. that he had told me that he was a, a war veteran and that he had, was a former right. police officer. And, you know, he had, his original stories had, been, had checked out right. about the drugs. I, and I will just throw in here, and having read this, he, it just, it, it's like an onion. The, this, the man is a pathological liar, and it, it, to an extent that it's hard to... You, it's hard to imagine someone could make up that much stuff about himself and be that much out there. We're, we're going to have to wrap this up fairly soon. So okay. I, a couple things I do want to I okay. want to get to before you go. One one is that uh, um, this story has also caught some na some attention in Hollywood, and uh, you are uh, I know you probably can't talk about a lot of uh, a lot of details, but uh, there is some hope that at some point people will be able to see this story on the big screen. Well, this American Life has a division that develops uh, content for features and for. Um, for television series. And Josh Behrman, that, that contributor, is very good at, at finding stories that, that um, can be turned into feature films. And, and had I, I sort of saw this as a movie the whole time. I didn't realize it at first. Yeah. I always thought, yeah. let's just do this American Life. But um, uh, Josh uh, wrote the magazine article that turned into the film Argo, which won the right. Academy Award for Best Picture. So, so Josh in This American Life, um, and I have uh, reached an agreement that, th that they'd serve as producers, my story and my life rights would be included, and a really exciting uh, writer-director has been attached, and sh I've read drafts of a screenplay where wow. Pete Crooks is a character. It's very, very surreal um, with the idea of this being a feature film. So you are the accidental investigative reporter. The setup turned out to be as, as a difficult a few years as it was for you, or particularly those few months, it turned out to be a, the, the story of your lifetime, really, to tell. Well, it was a big, uh, obviously, it was one of the biggest police corruption stories in recent Bay exactly. Area history. Easily the biggest story Diablos ever had as far as, like, you know, a, a major expose, right. but also really serving the community. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I'm a big supporter of law enforcement. You know, that's a very, very demanding job. And so I wanted in the book to give credit to Cindy Hall, right. the Department of Justice agents that did such an outstanding job. And, you know, they put their lives on the line. And well, you even had some sympathy for, for Norm Welsh, too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wanted he, has, to, I, he, was, he was a sympathetic character. I, I wanted to, to understand these characters. Right. I wanted to understand what in our society makes it so appealing to be on TV okay. that they'd be willing to lie to everybody to, you know, to meet that end. And if you want to understand that better, read the book, The Setup. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Lisa. This was fun. This was fun. Um, I'll let you oh, I, wrap back it to up. me, right? Back this to is you. Get Lit. This is your where, show. Where am I? So, um, Lisa, this is really exciting. I really appreciate you coming over to ask my me pleasure. questions about my book. It was a lot of work to get that story um, into book form and very, very uh, exciting and rewarding. I, was, I know it's in the library system now and yes. I just looked it up and all the copies are checked out and on hold so that was Excellent. very flattering. Um, my book is also available obviously in bookstores. Diablo magazine is on the newsstand at all your local bookstores and, and supermarkets and at diablomag.com. Thank you for watching uh, Get Lit. I love to interview authors on this show and talk about their writing, their career and their love of public libraries. And uh, the next episode you see, we'll, we'll be back to that format, but it was fun to get to be the author uh, in the author's chair this time. Thanks for watching Get Lit. I'm Pete Crooks.